It's time for Tupelo Tom and Big Lou talking. And now, here's Tupelo Tom and Big Lou. I'm Tupelo Tom. And I'm Big Lou. And And we're we're talking. talking. Oh, my goodness. Here we are talking yet again in the July episode of what we just said, talking with Tupelo Tom and (laughs) Big Lou talking. Man, we've made it seven months. I was just wondering, I was about to start counting and I, I, you know, I, I, July is such a big month in Elvis history that we could probably spend this entire episode talking about what happened in July over all the years, starting mm-hmm. in 1954. And we'll do that coming up, but uh, we have a very special guest later on in the program that's going to be joining us from his, uh, his hillside home in uh, Los Angeles, California, high above the Sunset Strip. Uh, a home gifted to him by uh, Elvis Presley back in the 70s. Jerry Schilling is going to be uh, a guest on this podcast. Our very first guest, Big Lou. I knew you were going to say that, yet I literally have chill bumps. Yeah. You say, hear, hearing it, even though I knew you were going to say that, <laughs> I'm so excited. This is really a, a monumental moment for you and me and Alex and our podcast and the fans. Uh, yeah. There's only one Jerry Schilling. And he's somebody that over the years, so involved in different aspects of showbiz. Um, I hope we talk about his work with the Beach Boys and and his career in Hollywood as a film editor. I mean, he really used the opportunity of being with Elvis and being around him uh, back in the day to to really have a separate career away from Elvis. It seems to have, uh, and I'm sure you'll you'll talk to him about this. Uh, I, th- I think Elvis really respected that. You could sense that. Yeah, that that Elvis respected his that he had an individuality about him, and you know Jerry, in the interviews when I've been around him, he's just cool, man. Yeah. I mean he's just cool, yeah. and and that's uh, great. I I may have told this story on a previous podcast, but it fits in here a lot better. Over the years, I was I've been friends with Jerry going on twenty plus years now, I guess, and we became friends when we worked together on a project for Turner. Uh, in Turner Classic Movies, and he and I got along really well. And he found out I was from Tupelo, so he said, "Oh, you're the you're the second most famous person I've ever met from Tupelo." <laughs> so I became T two, and I said, "Well, you're the second most famous person from Memphis that I've ever heard of, so you're M two. So we're M two and T two." But I was with him one time. Every time I would go to California on a business trip for Turner. I would call him ahead of time and I said, hey, because I used to stay at a little hotel on the Sunset Strip called Grafton, the Grafton Hotel, which is still there. It's a little teeny little hotel. And uh, it was only $500 a night is why I stayed there. (laughs) (laughs) Right. And uh, it was, you know, it's Hollywood. And uh, I said, I'll, uh, I'll, would you like to go to dinner? Uh, Ted's, Ted's buying it. You know, I've been gone long enough now. I I can tell the story. Um, (laughs) I would just take Jerry Schilling to dinner and we'd have drinks and food. And I, that would, that was a meeting that was having a meeting. Um, but I would go pick him up and uh, we were sitting at a place called the rainbow, uh, the rainbow grill uh, next to the Roxy theater on sunset strip. And it's this old Italian place, very dark inside. And there's like rock and I mean, Alice Cooper and Van Halen and all these pizza, a big rock place. Lemmy from Motorhead used to always be outside. I would play trivia with Lemmy at a little machine at the bar outside. So anyway, it's a rock and roll, dark rock and roll place. So Jerry and I are there and we're having our dinner, big pizza. And he gets up at one point to go to the restroom. And when he does, this guy from another booth comes over and he says, excuse me. It was Sebastian Bach from the rock band uh, Skid Row. Um, I didn't know any of their music, but I had seen him on a reality show. So I knew who he was. And he said, excuse me, but my buddies and I are sitting over in a booth and there's a photograph on the wall in the booth of Elvis and Nixon. And there's a guy in the picture that looks just like the guy that you're sitting with. Who is that? And I said, that's Jerry Schilling. He was one of Elvis's uh, Memphis mafia, one of his friends. And he got to go to the white house with Elvis. And he goes, Oh my gosh. I, I know that name, Jerry Schilling. He goes, do you think I could meet him? And I said, yeah, I mean, it, he'll <laughs> love this story. And so when Jerry came back, Sebastian came back over and, and I got to introduce him and they talked and, and things. And and when, when he left, I, I told Jerry, I said, you know, that photo, I said, he said, oh, I've dined out on that photo many a time. Right. And wow. Just, it, you know, and that was one of those things that that Elvis made sure the guys were in the room because the photographer was in that room, the Oval Office. So Jerry made, uh, Elvis made sure Jerry and Sonny got got brought in there. 
So just the kind of life that Jerry has led and, and all those places that he's been and all the people he's met, I'm excited that that he's taken some time because, you know, he's managing the Beach Boys, for goodness yeah. sake. And, and it's July. Uh, it's the summer. So this is, you know, their, their big time. So he's going to be a part of the show later on. But uh, before we get there, as we always do on this podcast, Jeff, I think we should look back at uh, briefly kind of what we've been up to. We talked about Tupelo and the festival there. And we were getting ready, I think, last episode to head off to uh, Inverness, Florida for Summerfest, I believe. And uh, that has since happened. So what was your how was your Summerfest experience, Jeffrey? It was great. Um, I I sang a few songs, but primarily I kind of took on a different role. I kind of helped more back of house and on the production end and and just the day to day operations end. And um, even though I know this because we have the same team we use for Jeff Lewis and friends and Helen and all the other festivals. It, it still amazed me how fluid and how great the front of house staff is. The volunteers are the back of house, the PA, the production team, and to watch the care and passion that people have. And of course the, the entertainers as always did a great job. And Tom, as we've said, packed houses, new faces, yeah. half yeah. the room, the energy level is just off the charts, especially with the newer fans. They just, they, I had so many people come up to me and they said, I had no idea this existed. I yeah. will be at everything now. Yeah. It was fun. And and on the kickoff night on Wednesday night, Cody Danith, uh, it's his hometown and he calls the shots. And uh, he had me doing a little uh, conversation with some ETAs of, of which our producer, Alex was a, a part of that. And, uh, I wanted to thank Alex on this broadcast, on this podcast, uh, for his open. He created because you know you guys, you are all we're all Elvis fans, but Alex gets to be a tribute artist to Elvis. But I, you know, I didn't get to be a tribute artist to Elvis. And the, the guy that I want to be a tribute artist to is Johnny Carson. So Alex created a little open for me on on that uh, that that conversations, and I got to come out to Johnny's theme. So Alex, thank you for that. That was a dream come true. You're very welcome. Yeah. And I got to talk to, to some of the guys and and we, we got to scoot them on down the couch, just like Johnny used to do and hear their stories about makeup and, you know, horror stories of being ETAs, some of the good times, <laughs> some of the bad shows they've had. And I really think that is one of the, the segments that I love the most to do is to because all you guys have such amazing stories because you're individual. I always call the ETAs ambassadors for Elvis. They're out there. Uh, they have territories. You know, um, and and they they travel the world, but but primarily they have territories in their hometown area where they they're the Elvis guy, and I just feel like they they have so many great stories to to share, and they don't get to do that a lot on stage because they're they're singing Elvis songs and they're mm-hmm. bringing entertainment that way, so that's always fun. And then Cody always he always like programs such interesting shows and performers together. Uh, I think that's 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 kind of a neat thing that that he does. And it was good to see, you know, uh, Dwight was there. Dwight Eisenhower, haven't seen him in a while. It was kind of, we got a lot of the the people back together that we hadn't seen in a while. Yeah, it was so much fun. And uh, of course, Alex did such a great job. We had Michael Chambliss. Of course, Dean Z, as always, was fantastic. Bill Cherry, Cody, just every time I hear that guy perform, he just gets better and better with every show. Yeah. Of course, I, I loved the, the conversations because it was for the pass holders. So it gave them something yeah. kind of special. Yeah. Moses Snow was there. Of course, Braxton Sykes just continues to get better and better. Uh, Emilio Santoro. Oh, yeah. 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 He is great. And he was on America's Got Talent when they did the AI thing or the virtual reality, whatever it was. He was the, the body they used as Elvis. And he was great. Ben Thompson, of course, David Lee. Oh, and the Infinity Band. God, oh, they yeah. were great. Yeah. And it's fun for me because a lot of times, like for Bill Cherry and for Ben and for Coat, I got to be Charlie Hodge. And to yeah. be up there with the band, it's surreal at times to be up there with an ETA and they're performing for the audience. And I'm just kind of right there in the middle of the band with my little mug of water and my scarf. And I'm like, how did I end up here? This is amazing. And the Carolina band was there. They brought such an interesting dynamic, those male voices with uh, Michaela and Casey with Infinity. Oh, that quartet, that uh, Elvis quartet sound. Yes. I mean, Elvis all, always had a, a quartet on stage with him, always yes. live. And so to have that band there and to have those guys, 
and you could tell they were getting into it. Like they yes. were looking, going, oh my gosh, this is amazing. They were having as much fun as we were. Yeah, it was really cool. They had never seen this before. Yeah. You know, and I think they were shocked. At, and, and, and you know, Tom, you and I talk a lot about this. David Allen uh, was back there. We talk about, you know, you turn around and need something. There's David. There's, yeah. you know, all the people. Uh, I was about to go on stage. And I kind of started coughing a little bit. Moses Snow comes running up with a glass of water. Yep. You know, yep. just things like that. It's such a family and such a tight knit group. And you could really tell. And one of the interesting things about uh, Inverness like this is, is uh, Cody puts us at houses that he rents and he groups us together. And in the past you and I had been rooming together and this year he, he blew the, he blew the team up and I guess he was afraid a podcast would break out or something. <laughs> right. And he had me in a house with, uh, Rianne and Ben Thompson and Emilio. Oh, so man. I was still the most British person in that house. It's amazing. <laughs> right. um, my DNA came back and, and it's, I'm, I'm so UK Scottish Irish. It's just <laughs> really upsetting to Ben, but uh, you know, our neighbor was Bill Cherry and Bill came over one night and he and I sat up till four o'clock talking after everyone else had gone to bed. I mean, just an opportunity for all of us to kind of get together off stage and hang out, which we don't get to do a lot. And the last night, uh, people, if they had rented an Airbnb in that area, they probably heard a lot of very loud <laughs> laughing and screaming because of that last night, uh, Dean and Emilio and Ben and David and a few others came up with this game. I really can't talk about it too much, but essentially it was throwing something in the air to see if we could get it to land on Ben Thompson's head. Well, and that sounds worse than it was. It was a, it was like a pool toy. It was like a small, like a, it was almost like a, a bean bag that yes. had been saturated with pool water. And the game was where, where they could get it to stick on yeah. Ben. Yeah. And the massive discussions, there would be five minutes of discussion about how many points that was with five seconds of action. Right. So the shoulder was a certain number of points. The head was a certain number of points. And if he was moving, it was, and, a double, was, moving. It was a, and if there was, I mean, there was, this was going and they could not settle. And, and finally I said, this is why we will never settle our differences in the world. They can't <laughs> even agree on how to score this stupid game, bouncing this thing off of Ben's head. The name we came up with probably inappropriate to say, so I won't, it, we, it wasn't intended to be inappropriate, but the more you thought about it, the more inappropriate it was. But I remember at one point we're arguing about, well, we should have this in this world. If I had to step up, I go, can we just get back to the basics of this game <laughs> that we invented seven minutes ago? <laughs> so that's the kind of stuff that happens behind the scenes. We all turn into 12 year old kids. Remember, uh, Rianne went to bed early that night. Right. Uh, we were two feet from Rianne. We were sitting oh. in front of French doors. <laughs> The bedroom was on the other side of the glass. We were two feet from her all night long. And she <laughs> never once girl. she never once came out and said to be quiet. <laughs> That's great. He's a pro. I'm proud of uh, Cody Dionath. This is kind of his uh, uh, Catalina wine mixer, for those of you that remember <laughs> the movie Step Brothers. And he started it, and it has grown and grown and grown. And uh, it was, the audience, of course, as always, was just incredible. Cody has got this... LED screen, but him and Alex have done such a wonderful job uh, putting video together. It, it was just, uh, again, one of the best festivals of the year. It was just fantastic as always. And that's, and the visuals that, that, that he puts together and, and Alex, I think you're a part of that too, a big part of that and putting the visuals together. There were, there were, there were a couple of moments on stage where there's imagery on the screen of Elvis, you know, in concert and doing things while, a, while a guy's performing, there was a magic moment that happened twice in one song that, and I, I think it might've been American trilogy. I'm not sure, but Cliff's guitar solo coincided perfectly with James Burton's solo in the concert footage that was playing on the screen behind him. And I was just like, I hope everybody can see this. Yes. <laughs> and uh, Michaela and Casey uh, in the, the backing singers over on stage left. And I was kind of on stage, right. We look, they could see the screen behind me and I could see the screen behind them. And the moment that it meshed with James and Cliff playing, we looked at each other like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. <laughs> and it, and, it, and then it happened again, like two minutes later. And we were like, this is, this is totally in sync. This is amazing. And, and we also were able to, 
I had made a note a year ago um, that the gentleman that played the flute uh, in Aloha from Hawaii in the American trilogy, the guy with the flute solo, seen by a billion people, um, the world's most famous flute solo, or at least most viewed flute solo, <laughs> um, uh, his name's Gabe Balthasar, and he was a musician in Hawaii for the last 50, 60 years, and he passed away last year like in that week of July, uh, and I made a note in my phone um, a year ago to remember him, and it came up while we were in Inverness. Wow. And um, while we were in the dressing room, this is Alex. This is what Alex does, okay? First of all, he walks <laughs> us through registering all these computers to be able to get into, to log into these things, you know, to, to record this. It came up on my phone, and I'm like, oh, and I think Ben was getting ready to go out to do Aloha from Hawaii. so. Without a lot of advance notice, I said, oh, I wanted to do this thing to honor Gabe, the, the flute player. And Alex pulled up a video. He goes, this, this guy right here? And he was playing the video of Gabe playing the flute solo in American Trilogy. And I said, yeah, that's the video. How can we? He goes, well, I, I, when we were watching it, I was downloading it. And so it'll be on screen. I'll bring it up during the solo in American Trilogy. And... Ben and I looked at each other wow. and said, okay, we thought, well, this is going to mess up. I mean, that just seemed too easy. <laughs> and lo and behold, if he didn't bring Alex, um, the magic of what you do with technology, bringing up Gabe's flute solo during the flute solo that Jody McDowell was playing to sound like a flute on the keyboards. And he was on screen. And so we were able to honor Gabe. And I thought that was kind of, that was kind of a neat moment. That's my favorite one of my favorite moments, you know, besides yelling and screaming two feet from Rianne's head. <laughs> that was my really most famous part. <laughs> right. well, it was great. Great job, Cody. His festival, the Summerfest, has always been about a week or two after uh, Tupelo. But next year, uh, Summerfest has moved uh, to July. Yes. And, and we've got new brand new dates. Jeff, do you have those dates for us? Uh, of course not. Why would I do something like that? I can't have those. Uh, oh, well, it's here. it's uh, July 17th through the 21st. There That's the last time I ever throw to you. I'm never throwing yeah, to you never again. throw to me again. <laughs> you know how on, on songs, your musician will, you know, the singer will look back and go, take it. I used to love when Tommy <laughs> Smothers goes, no, I, I don't want it. <laughs> Dick, Dickie would be singing and he would go, take it, Tommy. And Tommy's like, mm, I don't want no, it. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I don't No, You take, you take it back. I don't need it. <laughs> so July 17th through the 21st new dates for Elvis, the summer festival.com, or you can go to ETA festivals.com for that. And Jeff, we're going to, we're going to take a break and we're going to come back and we're going to talk about dates and Elvis history with a date with Elvis. And then if we get him on the line and he answers the phone, because sometimes he won't, if he sees me calling, he'll just let it go. But hopefully this time he picks it up and we will have Jerry Schilling. M2 will be right here on the, on the podcast with us as our very first guest. It's Elvis, Elvis Presley. Blowing it cool, shifting up, swinging low, and spinning fast at his biggest flick yet, spin out. When a motor's warm. It's Elvis at road racing. And she's purring sweet. It's Elvis at women. But he let me warn ya. You're on a one-way street. Elvis and Shelley Fabre, Diane McBain, and Deborah Wallace. She'll crowd your clothes. Watch out. Spin your wheel. Shift in. And you're gonna know how it feels to spin out. It's Elvis, flat out, all the way in. Spin out. Hear Elvis' spin out album on RCA Victor. Elvis Presley running wild in spin out. From MGM in Metro Color. Watch those curves, Elvis. Here. All right. I'm Tupelo Tom. And I'm Big Lou. And, and we're, we're still, still talking. talking. Yeah, we're really getting better at that, aren't we, Jeff? Kind of. Yeah. We're getting something at it. Exactly. Uh, we're to the part of the podcast now that we love to call A Date with Elvis, named after, of course, the album, but also because we're talking about dates in Elvis history. And the month of July, absolutely overrun with uh, with Elvis history. And we're 
primarily going to focus on the year of 1954 and kind of what happened in uh, July of 1954. It was July 4th, 1954, that Elvis got together with uh, Scotty Moore and Bill Black. They got together at Scotty's apartment in Memphis and kind of sat around and figured out what they were going to do in the studio the next day, of which was July 5th. And that's when they went into Sam Phillips' Memphis recording studio, Sun Studio, 706 Union Avenue, the next day. And everything they had planned the day before just kind of fell apart right in front of their eyes. I mean, they just, it, it was just, uh, if you read Scotty's book and all the all the memories of people uh, who have written a history of what happened in the studio that day, things were just not gelling. And, and Jeff, being a recording star, recording artist, Grammy nominated yourself, you've spent a lot of time in recording studios when it's not happening, it's just not happening. Red light fever. That's what they call it. When the red light comes on and you can't sing, you can't think. And and can you imagine the nerves? This is Elvis's shot. Yeah. And yeah. it's just not happening. And, 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 you know, Scott already had a band. And so he, they were just coming in. And, um, man, and then. During the break, Elvis is out in the studio strumming on the guitar playing That's All Right, Mama. And Sam says, what are you doing? And Elvis says, I'm just, just singing this song. And he goes, well, just do it again. And that was it. And if you've heard, there, there are a couple of versions available on different box sets. Um, they didn't do it that many times. Everyone a little different than the one before, but the, the master take, the one they released as the single, just absolute magic. And what amazed me, because, it, you know, I heard it when I was a kid. There was an album that came out in the 70s on RCA called The Sun Sessions. And it was all of the Sun songs on one LP, mid-70s, 75, yep. 76, maybe. And I had not really heard a lot of those songs because they were singles and stuff on Sun. And they didn't really get around a lot on later albums and things. And I just remember thinking, this is amazing. And it wasn't for a few years after that that I realized when you hear That's All Right, Mama, there's only three people on that record. They don't, it, it's it's Scotty on guitar and Bill on bass and Elvis on a semblance of a guitar and kind of beaten on the guitar. And it's just those three guys, just the moment it happened. It's such a unique mm -hmm. sounding record. You know, there's nothing before was just quite like that. Nothing after, just quite like, it was just this mix of gospel rhythm and blues country. I, 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 it's just a fan, it's like the perfect first Big Bang record. And if you've heard the original, it's, 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 no, it's nothing really like that. Um, it, it, it's, it's a song that originally um, was a, a Arthur Big Boy Crudup. Uh, and and it it was a rhythm and blues yeah. song. Obviously, Elvis had heard it. Elvis was kind of a you know a storehouse of of kind of all kinds of music. Um, but he he made it his own. Uh, even even with that first song, covering somebody else's song, making it his own, um, recorded July fifth at uh, on Union Avenue, and that was it. After that, brings us to our next day in history. Think of this, Jeff. Now, July 4th, they're at Scotty's house rehearsing. July 5th, they go in by accident, um, by accident, really kind of launch into, you know, the beginning of rock and roll. By July 30th, Elvis is on stage at the Overton Park Shell. And it's during that show um, that he is first, for the first time ever, his name is in the paper in the ad, Slim Whitman. Slim Whitman, who, if you were around in the 70s, uh, you had his album that you saw advertised on television because it was easier to just go ahead and yeah. order it than it was to continue to watch those commercials because they were they were unending in the 70s. Uh, <laughs> right. Slim, Slim Whitman, uh, the line my yeah. dad used to always say when the commercial would come on, it would say, Slim Whitman sold more records than Elvis and the Beatles combined. <laughs> And my dad said, what, does he own like a record store? <laughs> yeah, right. So that was the big joke in my family. Oh, that's right. But it's in this ad, um, and we talk about this on, on part of the, the Memphis bus tour that Angie Marchese from Graceland and I do during Elvis Week some years. We drive around Memphis in a bus with 99 of our closest friends, and 
go to Elvis sites around the city and we go to Overton Park Shell and we get out of the bus and we go down and we we get on the stage because it's still there. It's still the Overton Park Shell, very historic place. The ad for that says special appearance by Ellis Presley. <laughs> E-L-L-I-S. So his very Ellis first booking, Presley. Elvis's name is wrong. Oh Probably the last gosh. time uh, that Ellis ever had his name uh, misspelled. Um in an ad or anywhere. Uh, and, and, and that was the first time he kind of saw yeah. that audience reaction to, to what it was he was doing. Can you imagine that'd be one of those, you know, people always have those, if you could go back in time, where would you go? I would love to have been obviously at sun on July 5th, but I think I would have loved to have been almost as much at the Overton park shell for that first performance when he walks out on stage and doesn't know I mean, think of it, though, the only times he's really performed to his classmates uh, in, in, in school. And, and this is his first big concert in front of people who will let them know how they feel uh, about their act. Uh, and it all happened in that, that, that July 4th and 5th to July 30th, 1954. And then everything changed after that. And it was inside of this window on July 11th. That uh, that Jerry Schilling, a young boy in Memphis, um, met Elvis for the very first time, had heard the record on the radio uh, that that Dewey Phillips had played, had heard Elvis be interviewed on the radio um, with someone in the room, uh, Wink Martindale, a DJ there at WHBQ at the Chiska Hotel on the magazine level. Uh, Wink Martindale was there on that Sunday night in the studio when they they got Elvis into the studio to do his interview after they played That's All Right Mama for the first time. Jerry Schilling hears that, and it's July 11th, a few days later, that he meets Elvis. And uh, we're awaiting his phone call to uh, to be a part of this podcast. But just think of that that history just right there in those those days from July 5th to July 8th or 9th when they played the record on the radio to July 11th when Jerry meets Elvis for the very first time. He's a young boy, quite a bit younger than the than the other kids that uh, Elvis was hanging with at the time. And it's just in that one window of time, culture changed. The world changed mm-hmm. all from that one. Yeah. You know, what, what, what if they didn't end up, what if he didn't end up jamming to uh, that's right, Mama. What if Sam got frustrated? Uh, all kinds of things that that just yeah. You think how, how easily things could turn, and here we are. Yeah, sixty nine years later, that history of Elvis is one that's been talked about and written about almost for the last sixty nine years. Really, uh, there have been so many books written about Elvis. People ask me, uh, especially younger fans, you know, what can I read? What are the best books? So there are three books, really, I think, that kind of tell that Elvis history the best. And anytime any young fans ask me about that, I'll kind of point them to these books. The first one, the first one is uh, Elvis and Me by Priscilla. That's her story in her own words that she wrote a number of years ago that really takes you inside what it was like to meet him and, and get to know him and that life at Graceland in those early years. The second best book, I think, is Elvis, My Best Man by George Klein which um, really goes into what life was like in Memphis. I'm a, you know, I'm a radio TV person. So to hear, to read George's words about what Memphis radio was like at the time and to be friends with Elvis as a DJ, a working DJ in Memphis and George, such a great part of Elvis radio on Sirius all those years. And the third book, uh, maybe the, my favorite and the, the best book about Elvis, uh, me and a guy named Elvis, my lifelong friendship with Elvis Presley written by Jerry Schilling. And Jeff, when we come back from this break, that guy is going to be right here. Jerry Schilling, the very first guest Mm -hmm. on Tupelo Tom and Big Lou talking. And somebody else, Jeff, besides us, is finally going to be talking. Jerry Schilling after this. The legend. You know, people wonder how I do it night after night or something. I'm perfectly at home out there. I'm going to lose four or five pounds a show usually, but I don't mind it. Elvis the man. It's a new crowd out there. It's a new audience. And they haven't seen us before. So it's got to be like the first time we go on. Elvis the artist. Part of my 
MGM presents Elvis on Tour, a very different motion picture that captures all the effect of Elvis live. See Elvis as you've never seen him before. On three screens at once, hear Elvis at his super best. Witness the greatest showman of them all as the legend of Elvis Presley continues to grow. Elvis the legend. Elvis the man. Elvis on Tour. From MGM, rated G, general audiences. We're so excited to have you here with us, Jerry, because we have uh, done this podcast for a few months and we've been waiting to have a guest and we were looking for that perfect first guest and you were always at the top of the list. So Jerry Schilling, thank you for making time to be the first guest on Tupelo Tom and Big Lou Talking. Well, I am honored, and, uh, you know, I come from a history of the Tom and Jerry show. <laughs> <laughs> we, so, uh, no, it's great to be on with you guys. It's a real honor, uh, and um, thanks for having me. It, it is a special day for me. <laughs> I was going to say, we are recording this on uh, July 11th. And something very interesting, Jeff, in the life of uh, Jerry Schilling, who I call Memphis 2, because he's the second most famous person from Memphis I ever heard of. Um, <laughs> and he calls me Tupelo 2 for almost the exact same reason. Uh, something very special, Jeff, happened in Jerry's life 69 years ago today. Jerry, what was that? Well, a, a little lonely, somewhat orphan kid in poor North Memphis, had heard a record a couple of nights before and the night before, and I was pretty excited about it. I was 12 years old. I'd been listening Rhythm and Blues for about two years on Dewey Phillips' show, and, you know, it was just a lonely Sunday afternoon, and I walked over to Ava Wells Community Center, a little park that all it had was horseshoes and empty fields. And there was five older boys trying to get a six person. Uh, nobody was that popular <laughs> at the time. <laughs> and uh, lo and behold, I, um, I had said a little prayer be the night before. Uh, a good little Catholic boy at the time. You know, God, I'd like to meet this guy from Hume's High, because that's how Dewey Phillips introduced Elvis. I said, you know, the neighborhood isn't that big, knowing it was never going to happen. But, you know, just the week Elvis recorded, I think on the 5th, that's mm -hmm. right, Mama got played on the 8th or 9th or whatever. And... uh kept saying the boy from Hume's High. Well, my cousins went to Hume's High. My mother had gone to Hume's High. And so I said, you know, the neighborhood's not that big. I'd like to meet that boy. And uh, and I forgot about it. My prayers didn't really get answered. So <laughs> uh, I'm walking over to the park a couple of blocks from my house in North Memphis. And there was five older guys. One of them knew my older brother, and that was Red West. He knew Bill Schilling uh, a little bit. And he goes, hey, Jerry, you want to play with us? And I went, Jesus. Red West, you know, he's an all Memphis football player from Humes High. And I'm in grade school. So I tried to be cool. Yeah. You know, I <laughs> went over. Um, now, they had interviewed Elvis the night before interviewed him could have been two nights before mm -hmm. on the show and so we choose up sides <laughs> three and three not a big game and when I got into the huddle for the play I realized my quarterback was the boy from by Elvis Presley wow wow <laughs> So, yeah, it was uh, my lucky day, 7-11, July 11th, 69 years ago. And that's where I met, became friends with Elvis for the rest of his life and still very close to all the family members. And they are my family. And 
I've been very blessed to have a family like that. And then as Tom knows, then we have this whole extended family with all the fans around the world and because of our relationship with Elvis. So as Elvis used to sing, I never have to walk yeah. alone. Yeah. And you guys are still on tour with Elvis. You're you're headed to, to, to England uh, toward the end of this year uh, with the symphony. And uh, you'll be on tour for Elvis still all these years later. Yeah, I'm real thrilled about it. Uh, uh, October, we're going to uh, do the UK. Uh, and um, I was asked a few years ago about doing a tour in Australia. Priscilla couldn't do it. So she had asked me uh, and the producer to ask me what I do. it, And I was really weary. I said, no, <laughs> I'm behind the scene shot. You know, mm -hmm. I'm a manager and film editor and that type of stuff. So anyway, they made me a deal I couldn't refuse. Uh, and it was a way I could still manage the Beach Boys while I was out of the country. I was uh, pretty much scared to death. The first show was, I think, 10,000 people. And, you know, wow. to host the show. But I got to tell you, with, with the love from all the fans and the excitement with the orchestra and then Elvis on the big screen, I felt like I was back on tour. It was the closest thing. The audience was exactly like when I toured with Elvis. I mean... Yeah. There were people dancing in their aisles. There were people screaming. There were people crying. And, uh, you know, now they have to get the hook and pull me off stage. I <laughs> really enjoy it. That's incredible. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's amazing because, like you said, as we do this interview, uh, what happened and who you met 69 years ago. And you were that that little boy in that house on on Leith Street. Just you were just one street over from Humes, and and meeting Elvis. There was a a number of years, and this is one of the parts of your of your book. Me and a guy named Elvis that I I, I loved reading because I really didn't know this part of your life between meeting him and being invited to become a part of the Elvis group later on in the '60s. Tell me about that little window of time when you were still one of the guys that was maybe on the call list, like we're going to play football, come over and play with us. Uh, maybe you're at a game and there's Natalie Wood on the sidelines. I mean, you're still a part of the circle, but you're not inside the circle yet. Yeah, I'm too young to be inside the circle, you know, uh, when Elvis really takes off. I, I, I love that I knew him before he was a star. But to know him... He was always a star. When I saw him, I mean, in that huddle, I thought I was there with James Dean and Marlon Brando. He was mm -hmm. just so cool. Mm -hmm. uh, he would laugh if you heard me say that today. But anyway, <laughs> uh, so as we all know, the career took off very fast. But we still played football on Sundays. Uh, when he was in town, in 54, he was in town a lot. He mm -hmm. was doing dates and stuff, but by 55, he was on the road a lot. So every time there was going to be a football guy, the guys that had gone to high school with him or were uh, or a little older, uh, I would get a call from Alan Fortis or, you know, one of the guys and, hey, we're going to play football today. Uh, Elvis told me to call you. And then he started renting the movie theaters at night. Because uh, he's he's making money and he he can't go anywhere in public while public places are open. I was always welcome at the all night movies at the Mippian Theater. Same thing with uh, uh, the fairgrounds called Liberty Land now. Mm -hmm. But he would rent uh, the amusement park and we'd stay there all night and. Um, it was my secret agent life, if you will, because I was living with my grandparents and uh, uh, they were wonderful older people that really didn't keep too much 
back on me. So I had quite a nightlife <laughs> for a 12, 13, 14 year old boy. Uh, my, my mom had died when I was an infant. So that's, you know, uh, uh, so that's how that happened. Yeah. And uh, then when he got Graceland in 57, um, I was pretty much always welcome. I mean, now everybody's wanting to see Elvis on a personal level, and there's plenty of people to play football. And I thought my football days were over after about three weeks uh, of playing because the word was out. He had obviously a big hit record in Memphis, and there were plenty of older guys. And he'd look over, throw me a jersey, and it was like, you know, Kind of that look, wink, smile, like you know, you you were here in the beginning, uh, you know, yeah. uh, and that's how he took care of me. So, yeah. but you know, even through high school and whatever, I never told my buddies. And uh, but th- that confidence that Elvis gave me, the fact that he liked this poor little orphan kid in North Memphis. Uh, made me feel good about myself and where I was having trouble in grade school. Uh, I became president of the four years of high school in class. I became an all Memphis football player uh, and was going to college. I always wanted to work for Elvis, but by the, you know, after four or five years, I realized, you know, I had to do my own life. And as soon as I was getting ready to do that, <laughs> in 1964, 10 years later, mm. that's when Elvis called me out to the house. Mm-hmm. It was called Graceland the House. And said, I need you to come to work for me. Wow. And, uh, you know, I thought about it for about 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, when? He said, now. Wow. So I had to quit college. I was going to practice teach my last semester. And, uh, but I was going to be a history teacher. And I don't know, Tom, in a certain way, I kind of still feel like a little bit of a history teacher. <laughs> yeah. And you became part of it, uh, a part of the history of this country. I know that you, you've done an interview with um, uh, Eagle Bud Crow uh, telling the White House story. Uh, with the National Archives, and that interview of the two of you telling that Elvis and Nixon story is in the National Archives. So I don't think there's many history teachers that are actually in the National Archives of this country. So uh, I'd say that was a pretty good choice. You know, when we did that at the National Archives, uh, I didn't know how impressive that was and what was in there, which I do know now. I kind of knew the Atlanta Charter, (laughs) <laughs> things like that. Mm-hmm. But I'm in there with the independence because Elvis wrote me into his letter to Nixon. Yeah. So it was it was a great fun night. Uh, Buddy Eagle Crow was a great guy. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, to be a part of that. And that was the time where I had left Elvis because I wanted to learn film editing and mm-hmm. where I could, you know, be more... Uh, a part of the business, but I always wanted to turn that back into Elvis, and he always kind of wanted me to. Yeah. And uh, so I wasn't working for him on that trip when I went back to be next. Uh, I was working at Paramount as an assistant film film editor. Mm-hmm. Jerry, do you think? I, I don't think I've ever asked you this. Do you think Elvis had a um, a different feeling about you than he had about a lot of the guys because you had been one of the only few people who had ever said, Hey, I enjoy being here with you, but I'm going to use this opportunity and, and go out on my own and get a job and work because you could have just stayed there very easily and been a part of the group, but you, you used your connections and the people that you were meeting at all those studios to, to, to think about your own self. Do you think Elvis looked at that differently? I think that it made our friendship more independent in a good way. Mm-hmm. There was a time, one day I walked into the den out here in Bel Air, and he was sitting there. I've been working with him for about a year and a half. 
He said, you know, it's going to be the hardest thing for you to do. And I said, what are you talking about, Elvis? He said, to do nothing. <laughs> I didn't get it at the time. Hmm. And I also thought he was, as I looked at it over the years, he might have been talking about himself, too. Hmm. But the hardest decision I ever made was the first time I left working for Elvis. Because normally, well, I don't know too many people, if any, quit working for all this, <laughs> but normally then your relationship changed. Mm -hmm. He trusted the people that lived with him, worked with him. That was family. So it was very difficult for me, but it was very important to me because I never wanted to be a dependent of Elvis. I wanted to be a friend and, and somebody that, could help him never as much as he helped me, but but contribute. And and the only way I knew, and I didn't think that would ever happen, but sure enough, it did. Um, was to learn a trade. Uh, I did like Hollywood. I was, you know, all this is stand in for seven or eight movies. I got very involved in camera work, the editing work, and uh, you know. I think we had a little different relationship in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, there were certainly other guys in the group like Joe Esposito that played a very important part in Elvis's life. Best right-hand man I've ever seen. Yeah. Uh, there, was a, there was a lot of good guys. Uh, Elvis, Elvis knew people real well. You know, yeah. you didn't go to work for Elvis because you were an experienced bodyguard or you were an accountant or you were, oh, uh, you went to work for Elvis because it was somebody he trusted mm -hmm. and you're going to live in the same house and you're going to work at the same time. You're going to have fun. Then it was up to you if you were so inclined and motivated to look for your own niche, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, you know, I played various roles, in a lot of things, uh, but I didn't feel until I left the first time and the second time, uh, I didn't feel I was contributing enough on the business level. And I, I didn't feel good about that. Yeah. I, I, I felt on the personal level, uh, yeah. I was a good friend to him, and he was a great friend to me. So I wound up getting to work with him on his films. He finally said, "You get that editing job? Well, I'm doing a <laughs> film in Arizona. You want to come and do photo double and standing in?" And, uh, and you know, we kept the relationship. Two weeks yeah. after I quit, he called me and said, "Do you do that editing on the weekend?" I said, well, "I don't have the job yet." So, okay, I'm coming by and pick you up. We're going to Palm Springs. So wow. we never, the, the the friendship and everything never stopped. And I don't know of anybody else that wasn't involved that that happened to. So mm -hmm. I was thrilled. I was thrilled when he called me. Well, I don't want to overstress it too much, but it's almost more of an equal friendship in that respect that you are working and he is working. You both are working in the same industry. I don't think he differentiated between himself being a star and you being a film editor. You both had a common upbringing. You had been longtime friends and now you were a, a friend in the business. So I, I, that's the way I, 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 I see it. Uh, and, and knowing you uh, being the very professional person that you, you are, I'm sure even in your business life in Los Angeles, you didn't flaunt that Elvis connection. Just like you said, you didn't do it in the fifties to your friends either. No, no. And, uh, you know, the biggest uh, professional compliment in my life, and, you know, we just celebrated the 50th anniversary of Elvis on tour. Mm -hmm. And I was asked to do the liner notes. And Elvis on tour, again, I quit working for Elvis uh, to go in post-production. But that gave me an opportunity when I'd go visit Elvis that he would say, hey, how's the film going? And I'd say, well, you know, it's going really well. And he said, well, tell me something. And I'd 
said, well, there was this great montage by this terrific editor. But Colonel came by and said, Elvis doesn't want any old footage. So kill that. Elvis said, well, tell me about it. Well, this little unknown editor became Marty Scorsese. <laughs> <laughs> he was our montage editor. And by the way, the film won the Golden Globe. Mm -hmm. Best documentary of the year. So what that did, we had many conversations during the making of Elvis on tour, me and Elvis, about his film, which was the ultimate compliment to me. And then in 1974, and it's all in me and a guy named Elvis, my book, that's when Elvis asked me to open up a production company, and he and I would be the presidents of wow. Elvis Presley Films. Mm -hmm. And that's, I used a lot of the people from Elvis on tour, and we got editing offices on a corner of Hollywood and Vine in this big building. We sent the American karate team to England uh, to do their champions to France. Uh, and then we never got to finish it. I mm. think Elvis Presley Enterprise has put it out as the gladiators. Yeah. But I got to head up Elvis's own production company. And if he would have had the opportunity or had gotten the support, Elvis Presley could have been Clint Eastwood in that regard, or Barbara Streisand. With it. He had the feel. I used to see it in the editing room when he would watch the dailies. He could have could have been a big producer, Tom. Yeah. And you know this, and I know this from when you're an actor in a film, it's so much different than on stage or anything because it's so fragmented. But you said once that Elvis had this ability, even a week later, shooting the same scene a week later, to go back to that space that the actor has to be at to continue that role. And that's a talent in and of itself to be able to recall that for somebody that works so spontaneous on stage yep. for Elvis to be able to ha harness that. And then in a studio, go back and be at that same place again, weeks later. Yeah. Not only did he have a, have a photographic memory. Uh, I think he had a, a photographic, uh, persona. Mm -hmm. uh, he always knew what he was doing. I mean, Patty Moore told me something one time. It was very interesting. And he said, you know, I've never seen anybody that had so much rhythm in his voice as Elvis Presley. And Scotty was a pretty quiet, great guy. Mm -hmm. I always kind of called him St. Peter. He was the rock of the birth of rock and roll. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but now that I, I listen to Elvis's music, and I realize every word he's saying, he puts a, the emotion of what the word means into that vocal. Mm -hmm. And I, I've just discovered that in the last couple of years. And mm -hmm. I don't know. That's why he was the greatest artist. And there's a lot of great artists. But, you know... There's the industry, entertainment industry, great people, great artists, big fans of a lot of music, film. And then above that is Elvis Presley. Yeah. And that's why, you know, he's lasted and I think loved around the world so much. And I think one of the things you're going to notice as you as you go back out on the road on tour with Elvis uh, in the UK um, are the vast amount of new fans, younger fans that are discovering Elvis because of the film, because of, uh, because of Baz and the film last year. And this year has been really the highest of the highs and the lowest of the lows within this one year since the film came out in June of last year. Um, just, I just wanted to get, I don't want to get in the weeds on, on some of the things that have happened uh, over the last year. I, I don't want to, hash that out right now but but i do want to get your feeling about what you think of this last year of of in the career of elvis for his fans and and, and for the family well it's been certainly 
a roller coaster year for all of us. For myself personally, I was thrilled with Baz Lorman, Austin Butler, and Tom Hanks. Got to know them on the promotion tour in France and everything. Spent a lot of time with them. That was a real high. And, uh, you know, got to share that, uh, the Golden Globes, and a couple of nights before. And it was, it was really bringing Lisa out. And that was really wonderful because she had such a rough time after losing her son. She never got over that. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, um, uh, I went through a pretty serious, crazy death threat situation and danger of my wife. So this has been the most up, down, unusual, crazy year I have ever had. But I'm still proud to be here. Yeah. Well, we're so glad you're a, a, a part still of the of the Presley family. Um, you know, we're going to be together in in August at Elvis Week, uh, and you're 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 coming out just especially to share your memories of of, of Lisa Marie. And I just uh, wanted to thank you for inviting me to be a part of that to uh, to be on stage with you to to lead you through your your memories of her. Um, so the fans will have an opportunity to hear you really talk about your lifelong um, relationship with Lisa Marie? Well, you know, it'll be the hardest thing I have ever done since the eulogy. And I really count on you to pull out my feelings. You know me that well. You know, we spent a lot of time over the last couple of decades or more. Yeah. And, um, you're the first person I thought of is like, you know, you can't just sit there and talk. You need somebody to, you know, you can for a little bit, but then you hear yourself talking. And I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to do something, especially of this importance, I want to feel it. I don't want to hear it. I want the fans to feel it. I know what a loss this has been to the fans. And at the same time, I want it to be uplifting. I want some of the fun things that happen between Lisa and I. And uh, and there's a lot of fun things. And, you know, we, we had such a history. I was there when she was born. Uh, she became my secretary. She always corrected me. So I was her <laughs> sister, Jerry Schilling. Uh, yeah, Jerry uh, Schilling. Jerry Schilling. Yeah. yeah. Jerry Schilling. And, um, you know, I was her first manager. I I, I, I toasted in the place of her father when her and Danny got married. And I mean, I've been in, you know, such great, you know, from the beginning of her life to the very beginning to the very end. So I don't know, you know, Lisa's like her father, you know, she's tough in certain ways of, you know, no BS, if you will. Yeah. So I know she's going to be seeing all of us and hearing me and a little nervous. Yeah. <laughs> Lisa can make me a little nervous. You know, <laughs> she's the only person in the world that I saw make Jerry Lee Lewis nervous. So, <laughs> yeah. You know, Jerry, I saw, I heard her on Howard Stern show. She's the only guest he's ever had on there that she dictated how that show went. The interview. It was incredible. And you know what? You didn't rebuttal her because she, she knew what she was talking about. And you went, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I know, Jerry, when, when I was introduced to her, when Priscilla introduced me to her for the first time, um, she said, what's your name again? And I said, uh, Tom, Tom Brown. And she said, you're from Tupelo, right? And I said, yes, I am. I was like, wow, how did you know that? She goes, yeah, I've heard of you. Jerry Schilling's talked about you. And I couldn't tell from that, <laughs> is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, uh, it, it turned out to be a good thing. Absolutely. For, for everybody. And, you know, what you've done for the legacy of Elvis over these years, I know how proud he would be of you. And I can tell you how proud I am of you and being your friend and uh, looking forward to sharing good moments, tough moments, 
Yeah. Beautiful moments, thoughtful moments with you in Memphis in August. I'm 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 so happy to be a part of that, Jerry, and so honored by your invitation. And I know Big Lou and myself, um, we just want to thank you for for being a part of this podcast. And I know there are some some fans out there who are discovering Elvis, who are going through our podcast and, and listening to our stories and our facts and our details about Elvis's life. And it's so important to have someone like you to uh, to be there to tell that story of, of being being together with him. And uh, I don't know about you, Big Lou, but I think one day in the coming months, we have to do a, a Jerry Schilling part two. What do you think? Absolutely. Jerry, this, <laughs> this is such an honor. I, this was kind of uh, when we when we started this, our goal was to talk to you. And, um, you know, I've, I've got a billion questions, but I leave. I told Tom before this, I said, you know, as you know, Jerry, and as you so kindly said, Tom is brilliant at what he does. And I thought, I'm just going to shut up and let Tom uh, run this thing. But but a couple of things I did. Jerry, do you remember you're talking about you wanted to be a history teacher? Do you remember what part of history kind of interested you the most? It's a weird question, but I got a reason for it. Well, I, I, I liked all history, uh, American history, European history. Um, and I, I took all of it trying to get, you know, enough hours you know, to graduate as a history major and a political science minor. So, uh, and I never, I would graduate with uh, both uh, history in ancient European and American history. And that's what I wanted to teach in school. And I was hoping to be a football coach. Well, that, I, I was a football player too. I wanted to coach as well. I didn't have the temperament for it, but that leads me to my next thing, <laughs> uh, bringing the football up. But what I, what's kind of funny is your life being such a big part of one of the most important parts of our history, and that's Elvis Presley and what he did for the entire world. It's kind of like if you were George Washington's sergeant or second command with your experience with Elvis, and I remember Jerry during two a days, we would come home and we had time between practices to watch This Is Elvis. Then when it was over, we would get on our bikes, ride back to practice. And when you're talking about your relationship with Elvis, I obviously had not met you at that point, but there was something that just came off the screen that I remember looking at you thinking, man, I bet he's like really friends with Elvis. And it, it, it came uh, across that way on, 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 on my television. And I just thought, Man, that I want. I'd like to have been him. That'd have been really cool. And so it's just great to be uh, uh, talking to you today. And, and of course, the the Jerry Schilling stories uh, that that I, Jerry Schilling knows my Jerry Schilling stories great. <laughs> but I also was thinking uh, it has been amazing since the film came out. How many young people? Half the crowds are just now getting into Elvis. I don't think this is ever going to end. And you're such a major part of carrying on that legacy. It's, I want to thank you just from the fan standpoint for everything you did. Well, and thank you, Lou. And I hope to see you in Memphis. I'll be there. Uh, and if there's anybody that needs protecting, I'll have you do it. Okay, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. <laughs> With my life. Yeah, but, but what you and Thomas said about the young audience and everything. I mean, uh, I'm seeing that. I know Jack Soden is witnessing that at Graceland. Just to get in a good mood, I listen to the soundtrack, <laughs> parts of the soundtrack right before this call. And you've got so many contemporary artists, you know, yeah. that it just really fits, you know. Uh, <laughs> I love the two kings or whatever it's called with Eminem yeah. and Elvis. Yeah. That's great. That's your, your psych music to psych you up. Yeah. 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 And the young people that I know, and you know, I hang with all my friends, kids I've done it for years <laughs> and uh, I have things in common with them uh, musically and whatever. And this, uh, this album, you know, again, Baz Lorman is brilliant. Uh, yeah. I, I've met three, I always said I met three geniuses in my life. 
starting with Elvis Presley, uh, then Colonel Tom, uh, who, you know, I have a love for, uh, and Sam Phillips, who mm. I got to know real well, uh, Cindy and I, and uh, I produced an Annie biography on him and knew his whole family. But I'm adding a fourth to that now, and that's Bass Lorman. Wow. Mm. Tom, Tom, you may come in the top five. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I can just say top five. <laughs> so when y'all came to Memphis and showed the premiere, I was fortunate enough to get to see it when you were there and Baz and Priscilla and Lisa Marie and everybody, Austin, Tom, Mr. Hanks, and all, et cetera. And I was so fortunate to, to get to ask Baz a question. And I just brought up, I thanked him for obviously giving us this film, but also asked him, was it difficult and, and a challenge to show the uh, Unchained Melody scene at the end uh, in 77? I saw Elvis in Norman, Oklahoma at Lloyd Noble Center in March of 77. And to me, that part of Elvis's life, to me personally, as a singer, is as important as any part of his life. It was the humanity of Elvis, that voice, and it was, I loved his answer uh, that he gave me. We, we actually played it here on the podcast. But I was going to ask you, is there a portion of that film that you look at and go, not only was it very accurate, but really means the most to you? The one part of the film, you kind of go, yeah, that, that's touching me more than any part of the movie. Well, there, there's more than one part, but if, let me just say one part. It's very important to me is that my friends was one of the most unprejudiced people I've ever known. And there's been rumors and whatever. And I love the way the film starts and Bill Street and Elvis's, you know, reaction and interreaction with black artists and white artists. And I think that's why I always give him credit for writing half of If I Could Dream, where that line came up, If I Could Dream, where all my brothers walk hand in hand. That really, that part of the movie, I went, I started breathing. Uh, relax because I was watching the movie at Warner Brothers with Priscilla and I had not seen a frame of it. And this is when we were to watch it to see if we were going to go on the promotion tour to the Cannes Film Festival and other places. So that was, that was, other things were really important, but that was, that's the first thing that comes to my mind. Yeah. Wow. Well, it's it's been such an important part of the last year of of, of bringing those people, and uh, meanwhile, Jerry, uh, you're you're back to your old job. You're probably ignoring phone calls from Beach Boys who are calling you um, <laughs> because that's currently as you're you're you've been back with the Beach Boys for My some day years. Job. Yeah, yeah, that your day job. That's right. When you're not on tour for Elvis, uh, you're still with the Beach Boys. <laughs> yeah, just I'm just completing my seventh year back. Uh, back 40 years ago, I managed them for 10 years. So this is actually my 17th year with the Beach Boys. And they can't call me. As you guys know, I got phone problems today. Yeah. So what the hell? I'm going to go to Malibu and sit on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> and wait on them to surf by. They, uh, that's how you'll do it, yeah. I guess. Well, it's it, yeah. like I, I just wanted to thank you for your time in, in doing this. It meant so much to me to and Jeff and, and Alex, our producer, to have you as, as part of the show. And uh, our first interview ever couldn't have been a better person. Our first interview. And uh, I think next time we'll learn how to record it and it'll just go so much better. <laughs> and I'll have a phone that works, too. <laughs> thank all three of you, gentlemen. It is really an honor. And uh, a little boy in Memphis who said a prayer that God answered and is still answering. So. Thank you, guys. Jerry, thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. 
you've enjoyed this episode of Tupelo Tom and Big Lou Talkin', please visit us online at www.tupelotombiglutalkin.com and on Instagram and Twitter at Tupelo Tom Big Lou or drop us a line at Tupelo Tom Big Lou at gmail.com. This podcast is made possible by executive producers Jeff Lewis and Tom Brown, producer and editor Alex Mitchell, technical advisor Michael Cullifer, promotions and marketing advisor Cody Deganath, and also in part by our sponsors and listeners like you. Do you have an Elvis-related event that you'd like featured on Tupelo Tom and Big Lou Talkin'? Email us at TupeloTomBigLou at gmail.com to find out more.